Hi class, um, we are entering week 13. Um, this week we're focusing in on chapter 14 um, from your textbook. Um, there's a lot of different items in this, um, in this chapter, so I'm kind of focusing in on the last part of your PowerPoint slides. Um, there's so much to be covered um, with, with death and dying. Um, you have some great articles um, that are attached in this week I, I encourage you to look at and to read. Um, one of them has to do with spirituality, and I just want to reiterate how much um, this season in someone's life, whether it's they're just really old and they realize death is coming, or they've been diagnosed with a, a long-term illness, or um, maybe a loved one dies in their life, where this could be a huge opportunity to integrate your faith with your clients. Assuming your clients are open to it and bring it up, um, this could be an opportunity to possibly share the gospel, to maybe... Um, redirect someone towards church or maybe re-engaging with their faith or maybe answering some questions about faith that maybe they had incorrect. Um, so this could be a great opportunity for God to use you. And you know, with all your clients, you really need to pray for pray to the Lord for opportunities for him to use you with your clients, whether you talk about spiritual matters or not. But um, this this particular topic really brings up end of end of life type things, which have to do with where do I go after I die. So just something to be encouraged about and be mindful of. Um, also too, coming up is your brochure. Um, it, and that's not, you know, till the end of the semester, but there have been a couple of questions on what your on what the brochure needs to look like. I really want to leave that up to you. Um, you know, there's there's quite a bit of information that needs to be in the brochure. So I don't know if a trifold type brochure would would work, but if it's more of a pamphlet style, that's okay. I really I, I'm open to your creativity. So however you can creatively put together something that that resembles a brochure like item, um, then then that's great. Um, um, I, I'm not, I'm not particular on it, that it having to look traditional. Um, I'm opening it to it being creative. I'd like to see your creativity. So, um, it's fun to see. So anyhow, um, if you have any further questions on that, please let me know. Um, maybe I'll attach, I have a, another student's brochure, not from this class, but from another class. Um, and maybe I'll kind of give you guys like a screenshot of it so you can kind of see it. Obviously not to copy the material, but so that you can kind of see what it looks like and how it was sent into the professor. Um, so you have an idea um, of what a, a brochure would look like. Um, anyhow, um, another thing, sorry, another side note. Um, I wanted to tell you guys about a documentary. It's called, um, I think it's called Dying, Learning How to Die in Oregon. Um, I believe it's on Netflix. Again, it's about euthanasia, which is a controversial topic. It might be something interesting for you to watch. I watched it. It's very heavy. So if you're not in a place to see something very heavy, then I wouldn't suggest watching it. Um, but it's interesting because that's one of the states where it's allowed to legally get medical assistance to die if you have a terminal illness. So anyhow, um, that's that. So we're going to get started. I'm starting on slide 19, um, problems associated with dying in a hospital. So um, at the beginning of the chapter, it talks about, you know, most Americans typically die in a hospital or in a hospital-like setting. Um, so there's debates on whether or not we should tell a patient. Um, some people are concerned about stereotyping, how much hope to offer. The dying can represent failure and hopelessness to the doctors. So there, there's a lot of things that can be going on when a person is giving a, given a diagnosis that death is coming. Um, you know, and, and every family handles this kind of situation differently. Um, in my opinion, I believe a person has the right to know so they can come to terms with whatever, whatever it is that they need to come to terms with, but there may be reasons why people decide not to tell a patient or a family member. Um, so that might be kind of tricky, um, but but just so you know, that's something that every family does for a particular reason. So that might be something mindful to be mindful of in family therapy session. If somebody or say the parents know one of the parents has a terminal illness, but they don't want to tell their kids. So that might be something you know, <laughs> the kids don't know, and so with your secrets policy and things of that nature, that that might be something to be mindful of. Um, so hospice is, is a way that people, some people go to hospice to kind of um, 
basically die in a way where they don't have pain, they can be comfortable, and they're not in a hospital necessarily setting. Hospice can come to someone's home, um, or you can be at a hospice facility. Um, so hospice came from the United Kingdom. Um, there's volunteers um, to help um, ease the pain and suffering of family. So they'll come and visit patients, they'll visit the caretakers, um, just to kind of bring comfort and solace when they're going through this difficult time. Some of you may volunteer for hospice. It's a great thing to volunteer for. Again, it's very heavy because um, obviously people aren't in their best shape, um, but that is something you can do. Um, so it's about effective pain relief to remain comfortable and independent as long as possible, support through the, the stages of dying, and support dying with dignity. So again, especially if someone doesn't want to be resuscitated, um, or doesn't want a bunch of medical interventions, this is a way that a person may choose to live the last days of their life. Um, not being in pain, being comfortable, being at their house potentially if a nurse can come, um, and um, being around the people that they love and die in a way that is comfortable to them and they may feel may be of dignity. Um, a lot of people feel that's the way they would like to go rather than being in a hospital. Um, so palliative care, medical specialty focused on relief of pain, stress, and other debil debilitating symptoms of illness. Um, so a lot um, of different types of medications um, can be used now for pain reduction. So like they talk about here, skin patches, intravenous pumps um, to reduce side effects, pain, um, you know, there's other kinds of things that people are okay with now. We talked, you know, that's a whole other topic, but there's medical marijuana, things of that nature where, you know, people with life-threatening illnesses or who are very ill they are able to maybe um, reduce their inability to live life at the fullest that they can um, because they have certain types of pain meds. Um, so this is something to be mindful of. Um, and I think even not even if a person necessarily is at death's door, but maybe they had some sort of surgery or some sort of problem and now they've recovered from it, this is where substance abuse can become a problem. Um, and to be mindful of with an aging adult, I know some of you did substance abuse. I know like Barbara did substance abuse um, with the aging adult population. Um, so you might want to take a look at some of those um, projects that people did, the PowerPoint presentations. Um, but that's where, you know, pain pills and pain meds can be very habit for me if they're not if they're not looked out on as far as with anybody, but especially with the aging adult. It may not even be that the person is was trying to create a habit forming problem, but maybe they just taken the, the medication as prescribed, not realizing that they don't need to take it anymore and now they are kind of addicted to it. So this this is something aside from, you know, a death and dying situation to be mindful of when it comes to some of these heavy heavy narcotics because they can be quite habit forming. Um, so a movement advocating the view that dying can be a learning, growing, and positive experience has been termed the happy death. So, you know, this is kind of um, a, a new twist on how to look at dying. And I mean, again, if a person is very much at terms with, with where they are in their life, they're, they're confident of where they're going, it doesn't necessarily have to be this terrible um, outlook on life. Um, so this, you know, in 1906 was the first bill to legalize a doctor-assisted suicide. Um, and then this kind of grew until the end of World War II when the Nazi death camps were liberated. Um, the whole systematic termination of life became ab abhorrent. It became like so um, detested because of everything that happened in World War II in the death camps. Um, now there's a lot of debate and like there's people like Dr. Kevorkian. We remember, um, I remember him being in the news all the time growing up because of what he did for people. Um, so anyways, there's different cases. Um, in 2005, um, there was a husband who was finally granted the right to have the feeding tube removed after she was 15 years in a vegetative state. That's a long time. Um, there's someone, let's see, Karen Quinlan lived in a comatose state for nine years after life support machines were removed. Um, and, and I think even recently there's a, a little girl who um, had an adverse reaction to something like getting her tonsils removed. I don't know if she bled 
really badly or something happened in the procedure um, that wasn't supposed to go as planned and she ended up in a comatose state. And so then the, the mother um, was fighting, I believe the state on keeping her in a certain sort of state. So um, wanting her to be, I think on life support or something of that nature. It was a recent case. Some of you may be more familiar with it. Um, now I, I left this discussion on here. Um, you normally have to take these off if I go over PowerPoint slides, but this is something for you guys really to think about. Would you want to be kept alive if you needed to be on life support? Um, that's a heavy question, and this is, these are the kinds of questions that clients are debating. These are the kinds of questions you need to think about even if you're not near death, um, because someone in your family or someone close to you needs to know how you would want your last days to look like. Um, and that sounds so depressing, but it's a reality. Um, would you want to be kept alive if you needed to be on life support? Um, you know, some people want every medical intervention done until finally it's just done, you know, or for other people, they, they are like, okay, if you have to use machines to keep me breathing, I don't want it. Um, so this could be a question that a client could come in, um, and, maybe really be trying to seek what they want done for them. And maybe they're dealing with the debate of family members saying, no, get everything done possible. And this person's like, you know what, I'm done. I'm tired. I don't want to deal with this anymore. Maybe they've had a long-term illness such as cancer or something. They're like, I'm done. I just want to go in peace. Um, and so that might be even a family therapy session with an aging adult or someone with a long-term illness. Um, things to be mindful of. Um, these are kinds of questions somebody may ask, you know, what is the difference between killing and allowing a person to die? What is the difference between stopping treatment and not beginning it? Are there reasonable and unreasonable treatments? You know, some sometimes people eventually feel like, you know, they're an experiment and, and people don't like feeling that way. Um, so advanced directives instruct the doctor on how a person wants to basically, what kind of interventions they want done at the end of their life. Um, 90% of Americans will have a managed death in a healthcare facility. So that means most people that are going to die will die somewhere where it's either a hospital setting, uh, some sort of care facility. Only 30% of them will have advanced directives. So even for you to think about, um, what is it that you want done? Do you want a DNR? Um, do you want a living will that talks about your plans? Um, these are things to think about. Um, so passive euthanasia is the process of allowing people to die without using extraordinary means to save their lives. So not giving antibiotics, um, things of that nature. Assisted suicide is performing a deliberate act to end a person's life. And that's what that documentary is about, um, learning to die in Oregon. Um, I believe Oregon, um, Let's see, between 40 and 50% of physicians believe that physician-assisted suicide may be ethically permissible. Around 66% favor its legislation. Um, I believe Oregon, 1997, Oregon became the first state to pass a law allowing doctors to hasten death for the terminally ill. So they have to go through a process. Um, so um, anyhow, um, it's a very controversial issue, you know, from a believer standpoint, um, you know, there's different thoughts on suicide. Um, obviously, like the Lord um, sees suicide as a sin, but in these situations, it brings up a lot of controversy. Um, God determines your days, so it's kind of taking control into your hands. Um, so there's a lot of debate. Um, that documentary is interesting because you see an interesting perspective. Um, but again, um, this is a time to like to really, if a person's open to faith and open to the to God. Um, where you can really hopefully instill peace and um, and God's and God's perfect peace in them. Um, and again, this is a, a a topic where a lot of arguments are for assisted suicide and against assisted suicide. So not only the reason I want to focus on this section was these are things not only for your clients that are going to have to think about this, but these are things too for you to think about. Not to be morbid, but hey, you know this is a reality for all of us at some point in time. Um, so anyhow, this is chapter 13. Um, I hope you guys are, or I'm sorry, not chapter 13, chapter 14, week 13. Um, I hope you guys are doing well. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks. Have a good day.